Last talk of the day, you've almost there, you've done really well. You're all looking actually pretty focused, considering it's uh, been a long day. Yeah, it's, um, no one's looking too bad out there. Well, maybe one or two of you, but I'm not going to tell you which ones of them you are. Okay, right, so it's our last talk of the day. I'm sure it's going to be a blinder to finish this off with. No pressure. No pressure. Um, there we are, so uh, just, just to make him feel really uh, confident that he's going to give something great, please put your hands together and welcome Adrian. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm actually extremely thrilled to be here today. There's plenty of friends of mine, ex-colleagues of mine who came as well, current colleagues of mine who are here as well. So it's, um, it's really a great, great moment for me. So my name is Adrian. I'm a self-taught software developer. I'm 42 years old, and this is my story. A couple of months ago, I came across this tweet. Um, yeah, so I'll let you sink in the image. And as you can see, the inflection point, or the, actually the connection between the two lines, the blue and the red one, is exactly more or less at 40. So you can say that I'm pretty much in that situation where I'm asking myself, am I on the red path or am I in the blue path? Hopefully, I'm in the blue path. But it's a big, big question anyway. So when I saw this, I realized where I was as a developer and where I started. I started thinking about how it all started. And it all started in 1997. My career started in 1997 in uh, a city called Olivos in northern Buenos Aires. So you cannot probably say by my family name, but I was born in Argentina. So it turns out that this is where I started. Uh, and the day I started to work, it was exactly in the morning of Monday, October the 6th, 1997 at 10 a.m. Buenos Aires time. So for those who speak Unix, and I was 24 years old. This was me, yes. And, uh, and this was a web. This was the future. This was portals. You know, Excite was all the rage back then. Uh, portals were going on NASDAQ with valuations of billions of dollars overnight. It was a huge, huge thing. However, there weren't any cookie, blue, cookie advertising, like you, you want to receive cookies in your computer, this kind of thing. We didn't know about that yet. A couple of days before I started my job, a couple of weeks before, uh, Bill Gates had injected $150 million into Apple. It was a very different Apple back then, and it was a very different contrast between Steve Jobs and Bill Gates on the same stage. Uh, the remains of Che Guevara had just been taken from Bolivia to uh, Cuba. The fourth season of Friends had just started a couple of weeks before. We were still mourning Lady Diana, and actually, a bit more importantly, Mother Teresa, Roy Lichtenstein, and Gianni Versace. Uh, people were playing Final Fantasy like crazy in their PlayStations, for those who remember. The Teletubbies had just started broadcasting as well, <laughs> a couple of days before I started work, and uh, this was about to happen a couple of weeks after I started working as a software developer. Uh, which would become the biggest blockbuster in the history of cinema, and still is. This was a, what a smartphone used to look like. This is the Nokia 9000 communicator. I don't know if any one of you has had one of these. Uh, there you go. The, the chip inside the hardware is really interesting. It was a 386 Intel CPU inside of this machine, uh, and the operating system was GOS, for those who remember from the PC era back in the 80s. This is a smartwatch. What we called was a smartwatch back then, uh, top of the line Casio watch. This is Gary Kasparov being very worried because for the first time, a couple of days before I started my work, uh, a machine beat this great champion at the game of chess. Using not artificial intelligence, but actually brute force. That was the key of Deep Blue, and it's a very interesting point that you should keep in mind. And this was about to happen. Actually, it had just happened pretty much the week before I started to work. One of the biggest songs in the history of pop music. And these guys were going to start paying royalties to the Rolling Stones for the rest of their lives. People were starting to get crazy about the year 2000. Uh, you know, we were like really close to the Y2K problem, so nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. So as you can see, some people didn't prepare really well to this problem. And 1997 was an year that was featured in many, many science fiction films. For some reason, Escape from New York, The Godfather 3, 
um, at the curious case of Benjamin Button, but most importantly, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, happened a couple of years before 1997. And the date of 1997 was very important in the story, because on August the 29th, 1997, at 2.14 a.m. was the moment Skynet became self-aware, exactly. Now, interestingly, that didn't happen, right? Because it didn't happen. However, Google.com was registered a couple of days after that. So, I leave it up to you to see if Skynet was born or not at that date. So, what was that first job of mine? Well, my first job was as a web developer. I started my career as a web developer, which basically involved, back then, uploading through FTP stuff on a server running NT server, uh, NT4 server back then, uh, somewhere in upstate New York. We had our servers on a, on a hosting, very big hosting company. And basically, you could log in into this machine uh, and basically, you know, have the typical start menu. And we would run inside of that server a SQL Server 6.5 database. On top of it, we would put an IIS 2.0 web application running ASP pages, active server pages, written on Edit Plus or Hot Metal Pro. Okay, that was my editor of choice back then. This is what web development looked like. This was way before CSS. There was absolutely no CSS. There were only font tags, okay? And, of course, the, the, pr the product of that work would run on Netscape 3 or Internet Explorer 3, which were, back then, the real things. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry. I'm really deeply sorry, deeply sorry. This, is, this would happen actually really all the time. This is what it looks like. So all in all, since that Monday until today, I've been waking up and going to work for 6,776 days. I got this number, of course, by making marks on the wall. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I actually went to datecalculator.com or something like that. Many things happened during that time, okay? The most important of which being that I, I got married. Uh, and we're going to celebrate 10 years of marriage very soon. Um, in a professional life, I created a company that some of you might remember. I created a couple of open source projects as well. Some of you might be using Swift Moment right now. But maybe some of you have used NIP to Objective-C, which may a cool but I should probably update. But it get me an article on Ars Technica by Erika Sadun herself. So this is what celebrity looks like for me. I got interviewed by Bonto. I don't know, where are you, guy? Remember this? You interviewed me back in 2010 about the iPad and whatever was happening at the time. And uh, I also happened to be featured in the center page of Sontag Zeitung, which is one of the biggest newspapers, so I'm right at the bottom right there. Yeah. And I wrote two books, wrote two books, and I also burned down uh, myself, not the books. So I had, unfortunate, unfortunately, I had two episodes of burning down, which I really don't wish this to anyone. Um, so I really had to tune it down. So this also has made me reflect a lot on my life and what I do and what I do every morning and so on. And actually, this is the funniest part. I've been featured twice in TV, once in Bolivia, once in Switzerland. And in neither case, they were able to copy paste my name properly. <laughs> so how did I manage? How did I manage to actually, you know, have a smile on my face every day that I've woken up those 6,776 days? And I started thinking about what it took, the things I did to actually, you know, enjoy my job every day. And I found 12 tips, 12 things, 12 items, little tips that might help you. So that's my... That's my role today, is to entertain you a little bit and maybe to give you some data as well. The tip number one is to forget the hype. This is a very important, there we go. This is a very important tip. This is the first thing that I actually think that made my job actually really, really uh, sustainable in the long term. 
You know, since 1997, there's been a lot of technologies that appeared and disappeared. Some of them remained, but they were all hype, very hype technologies. For example, in 1997, we had Corba and RUP. You know, the whatever request broker architecture and RUP, you know, the, the, there was no, there was no Agile. The Agile manifesto has, had not been written. It's been written in 2001, if I'm not mistaken. In 2000, it was SOAP and XML, of course. Everybody, everybody was writing XML schemas. You know, HR people, you had the HR XML. You had mining people, mining XML. Medical people, for every illness, you've got an XML for every illness, you know? And then you would use SOAP to take this stuff from one side to the other. Guess it didn't turn out quite well. In 2003, it was model-driven architecture and software factories. This was the big thing back then. Everybody was thinking of getting rid of us, the software developers, because we would just create a new ML diagram, and the whole thing would be defined by this UML diagram. Didn't work out well either. In 2006, it was a semantic web and OLPC. OLPC, which turned out to be Android tablets by now, but they are still around, but it's not clearly not the, the original vision that they had. 2009 was augmented reality. Everybody would be like that. Oh, I'm hungry. I want to find the restaurant. Oh, there's one right there. No, it didn't quite work out that well. In 2012, it was big data. Everybody was a rave about big data. It turned out that only NASA and CERN required big data. The rest of us could use a very nice NoSQL database, and everybody was happy. And right now, apparently, it's virtual reality and bots. Whenever you tune into MSNBC, seriously, all the tech startups that are raising billions are doing one of those two things. So uh, then again, it's hype. I don't know for how long. I cannot know. So I just leave the question mark right here. In any case, I want to go very quickly to SOAP. And let's state it very clear, SOAP, it's crap. But you already knew that. For each one of these technologies, we have had one of these Gartner, Gartner, or Gartner cycles of technology, right? Um, some of them have reached some kind of plateau productivity because they're being used by probably one or two people in the whole planet. So you can say that it's a certain plateau productivity, but clearly, clearly, you can forget about productivity. However, however, thanks to our dear friend Cedric, if you're watching us, hi Cedric, I told you that this tweet was online. Um, Swift is as well a way to get into the Swift hype, so please, Let's make a lot of attention, let's pay a lot of attention and try to separate hype from, uh, you know, substance, if you wish. The second most important tip that has kept me interested in this industry is to choose my galaxy. What do I call my galaxy? Every technology that you choose is a galaxy. Android, iOS, um, Django for Python, uh, Ruby on Rails, .NET, all of these technologies, well, J2E, for example, all of these technologies have stars, dark matter, black holes, dead planets. And clearly, there's a lot of hype surrounding these galaxies. So you got to be very careful when, where, where you're going to put your chips, because this is like a big table in the casino. In my case, I migrated from one galaxy to the other. I started my career as a .NET developer for during 10 years, from 1997 to 2007, more or less. I was a .NET developer. And after that, I migrated to the iOS galaxy, which has pretty much brought us together tonight. Uh, I got to say that it was a great change. And the reason why I changed from one galaxy to the other is not a technological one. It's actually a social one because the people who live in that galaxy are absolutely awesome. They are creative people, artists, people that just happen to code. I've met musicians, I've met painters, I've met writers, and they happen to write apps to support whatever they do. There's a richness in the Apple ecosystem, or what I call the Apple galaxy. How do you choose a galaxy? How do you go from one galaxy to the other? My tool is to learn about software history. Whenever you get interested in one of these galaxies, it's very interesting to actually see how things have evolved from their very beginnings. Why were technology cho choices made in a particular way or another? For example, let's say that you're into .NET. How did .NET come up to be? How did C Sharp was, who created C Sharp? Why? 
What was the market situation back then? Who were the, enemy? Who were the enemies of Microsoft back then? It's a very interesting thing to understand these dynamics, social dynamics, economic dynamics around each one of your technologies. In my case, I would suggest starting with a little bit of, of reading. And I will suggest you six books, and I will tell you why later. First of all, Dealers of Lightning, the history of the Park Palo Alto Research Center by Xerox. This is a must-read book. It's a novel. It's an incredibly entertaining book that gives you all the story about how the GUI was born, the postscript printers, laser printers, uh, Ethernet networks, email. Lots of things that we take for granted were born in an unknown place somewhere in Palo Alto, California. My second pick is, of course, Revolution in the Valley, because it's the history of the Mac. There's a lot of the spirit of what we do as iOS developers uh, inside of that, but there's a telling tale about how technology is created and why certain choices are made. Of course, open source is a major force in our world, so I would, of course, recommend you to read the Cathedral on Bazaar, but even more important than that is the success of open source by Steven Weber. Steven Weber is a political scientist. He's not a developer. He got to, down to studying the dynamics of open source software from a political point of view and explains why the BSD license is the way it is, why the GPL license came to be, why Stallman took the choices that he, he did take. It's a very interesting telling tale. Windows, it's a major, major, major component of our history. But if you really want to know as a developer why Windows is such a clusterfuck, that is the book that will tell you all the clues. This book explains why you can run Lotus 123 on Windows 8. And it will surprise you. And of course, the most important book of them all for me, I think, The Mythical Man Month, most of what's written inside is not important per se because it might map to your expectations. Okay? It's not exactly like your projects will be exactly the same as the OS 360 project. Well, maybe, I, I hope not, but it could be. Um, but it's very important to see how the dynamics between the team members, between the project managers, how all of those things were mapped back in 1967, 68, 69. How many millions of dollars have been spent for one of the most important, um, commercially important projects uh, of that era, which is the uh, OS 360 from IBM. In, from a historical point of view, there's a lot of technologies that is worth learning. Tech, next step, that we call Coco, Bash, Lisp, C, Emacs, ARM, all of these things have been around for a long, long, long time. They are solid foundations for you to build upon, to create new things. But the most important of all technologies... Connection, connection lost, that's why. <laughs> the most important of all technologies, connection lost, is, of course, Vim which was around, as you can see, in French TV back in 71. Uh, I found a commercial about Vim, uh, which turned out to be, well, n nothing related, but I like the idea of a very old technology, and Vim actually quite fits the bill, you know, because I like Vim. I, and I actually will continue the rest of my talk talking about Vim, because Vim is such a powerful and great editor. You should all be using Vim. Okay, no, but maybe for the next talk. I will leave you with this. It's a tweet that was going around. You might have seen it. The most important thing that I want to point out is the last phrase. Learn the fundamentals. The rest will change anyway. But it's important to learn the fundamentals, okay? This guy graduated in 2000. Many of the things that we take for granted today didn't even exist back then. So I think it's a very powerful message. Sorry. Fourth item, keep on learning. This is something that is a bit stupid to say because you will all agree. Uh, in any case, what I will tell you tonight is two simple tips. I would love if, it, if this worked. No? Well, let's go. Let's come here. No worries. Two simple rules to uh, understand and to follow. Very simple ones. The first of all, learn a new programming language every year. I haven't created this rule. This rule comes from a book called The Pragmatic Programmers. 
uh, absolutely amazing as well. One good addition to anything that you will want to read in your, uh, in your life. Let us be very clear. You can learn a programming language for, in a very easy way, creating a hello world. In my perspective, it's a bit limited. What I try to do every time I, create a, I, I, I learn a new programming language is actually to create a small calculator. That's my thing. Every time I meet a new programming language, I try to make a simple calculator. You know, four, four operations, a couple of registers, nothing else. But it gives me the feeling of how to create a user interface, how to mo create modules of code, how probably to reuse the code in other contexts, like a command line, for example, these kind of things. Personally, I find this quite rewarding. And the second thing is to read six books every year. This is something that I've been doing consistently for the past 12 years at least, and it really pays off. It seems like a lot, but it means that you're reading one book every two months, and most of the books I've recommended here are not even 200 pages long. You can read them in probably one weekend. By the time you reach 30 years old, if you start by the, by the age of 20, if you start by 20, by the age of 30, you're going to have read 60 books. And by my age, you will have read 120. But don't just read. Take notes. And buy paper ones, believe me. Nothing beats the feeling and the smell of paper books, in my opinion. So I gave you already a couple of suggestions for the first year. And that's why I'm showing six books. This is my suggestions for the second year, of which many of these should probably be known to you already. But I will highlight this one, Agile, by Dr. Bertrand Mayer, who happens to be a teacher here in the Polytechnicum of Zurich. This book is absolutely amazing. And it's a critic of the hype surrounding Scrum, Kanban, Extreme Programming. It's fun because the guy is witty. He actually makes very good use of kind of a British kind of humor. The book is a delight to read. I, can, I cannot stress how much this is a great book to read. But any of those will most probably give you something to think about. Jeff Atwood was saying a couple of weeks ago that if he could go back in time, he would tell his younger self to learn Unix. And why? Because this way you can understand what's going on on this screen. This is a Unix command. It's a beautiful piping between Fortune and Pony, say. And of course, you want these kind of things on your terminal running all by itself uh, on a kind of a, kind of a cron job or something that gives you these kind of pretty pictures. The fifth more important thing that has kept me alive and with a sense of fun in this industry is to teach. Whenever you learn something, go and try to give it to somebody else. You know why? Because teaching is the best way to learn. It's as simple as that. And it's Daniel who told me this exact phrase a couple of days ago, and I'm so happy that he's here. Because I took this advice, and seriously, it has paid off. Teaching makes you humble. Teaching brings you in a new dimension. You learn things much, much better. And you are actually making a difference in the world. I had the chance to be teaching for a, for a while now, but the most important of the situation that I had by teaching was the following, and it's, uh, it's, a really, it's a really nice anecdote. It's, uh, I had once, I was giving a training about mobile web, this hideous thing that I now despise, and I had a student who came to my training, and she wrote me back, a couple of months later, she wrote me back an email, an email to say thanks. And she told me her story. She, she was a single mom with a child. She had lost her job because she was a Flash developer, Action Script. You know, this was 2011. Flash was going down. People who had been developing Flash apps for 12 or 13 years were out of work. And for her, it was a very tough situation. All alone, kid to feed. She wrote me back to tell me, thanks to your training, I found a job as a mobile web HTML. Uh, JavaScript and CSS developer. And uh, I don't know about you, and I don't think I really changed the world in any way. But inside of me, yes, a little bit. There was a sense of accomplishment. There was a sense that I had maybe nudged the world in a direction that I hope was a bit better. I came to the realization that most workplaces suck. And this is something that I had to accept. It's unfortunate, but this is the way it is. And the biggest culprit is open spaces. 
Open spaces are a cancer of our industry. And I cannot state the words enough. I cannot stress these words enough. It's a cancer. Managers think they are actually doing us a favor that we work better in those environments. It is not true, and it's unfortunate. So if I can recommend, get the Bose uh, noise canceling headphones, although pay attention, because in my case, I'm starting to feel a little bit of tinnitus. So pay attention to that. I am actually having to see a doctor for about that. So there's a downside, and there will be no insurance to pay for whatever treatment I need for this, OK? So this is very important. This is something that is very unfortunate, but it's the way it is. However, whatever you do, I learned that I had to know my worth. And you know what? It has to do a little bit with this 10 times engineer. We've all heard about this myth of the 10 times engineer, right? But it doesn't work the way you think it works or the way you've been told it works. I actually think I find out, I found out how it works, this 10 times engineer thing. And I'll tell you my little secret. What I think it is, is that we get paid 100K, whatever the currency, for doing our job, but we create a million in value in whatever the currency. This million in value is not marketable immediately. It's not something that these managers and the founders of these companies can go and cash immediately. But they will cash it when they get bought by big companies, when they create products that are super successful. And most of the time, they are the guys getting the Porsche, not you. So pay attention to this. The 10 time engineer thing is unfortunately something that exists. And I will leave you with this telling tale that I think will resonate in many of you, unfortunately. Another thing that I had to learn was that we have to send the elevator down. I'm a white guy. That already puts me in a position of privilege, tremendous privilege. I'm a white male. I've seen women harassed in workplaces I've worked. I've seen people of different ethnics, different countries, nationalities, disabilities, people with disabilities as well, being mocked by people who, you know, know a bit better than that. I think we have a responsibility. I think I have a responsibility as a white male to send the elevator down and to make everything in my power to empower women of any color, people from other countries that have the skills and the willingness to get into this industry, to create opportunities for all of these people, to add accessibility features to our apps. And this is something that we just saw a couple of hours, uh, one hour ago right here. Accessibility is inclusiveness, OK? This is super, super, super important. And I actually think that we have to make a difference if we really want to make our industry a better place for all of us. We have to work on these things. We are very, very far, very, very far from an ideal state. And I do believe that the desirable developer kills, skills are the ability to ignore new tools and technology, taste for simplicity, good codes, deletion skills, and humility. So we need a lot of that in our industry. Another thing that I started to pay attention a lot that has actually paid off is paying attention to LLVM. Everybody's very happy about Swift. Everybody is raving about Swift. But you know what? The interesting stuff is right below it. It's called LLVM. And LLVM is actually powering most of the most incredible stuff that is happening right now in our industry, including Metal, Rust, Swift, Piston, Mscript, and, and I, I, I didn't have the, I, didn't, I didn't include everything that I found. Microsoft is working on a bridge between LLVM and the CLR. Uh, Facebook has been working on a PHP interpreter based on, C on LLVM. Uh, the, the Dropbox is working on, P on Piston. Uh, and I don't know who else. Google. Google uses LLVM for the Android NDK. Let us be very clear. Two of the most loved languages in the last year, Stack Overflow, Paul, where language is based on LLVM. LLVM is one of the most important technologies of our current time. We are going to hear and we are going to see ripples from LLVM, I think, at least 20, 30 years from now. And I really think that Chris Lattner, which is the founder of the project, of course, and main architect, is really thinking about the future, about the successor 
of everything that we are using now, C Sharp, Java, all the mainstream technologies, the foundation of LLVM is going to take us very far away. So pay attention, pay attention to whatever happens on LLVM. I learned to follow my gut, you know? A lot of people told me early in my career, oh, you should choose a very nice technology, a galaxy, right, and stay there and create a career. Sometimes, just follow your gut and move from one galaxy to the other. Like in my case, I went from Microsoft to .NET, because you gotta follow your heart. <laughs> and it's, it's a very, very simple message I can leave to you, or in this case, it's Daniel Kibblesmith who will leave it for you. APIs are king. We're all mobile, interested in mobile apps right here in this audience. In my opinion, a good mobile app is primarily because the API rocks. A good API will give you an excellent mobile app, no matter which user interface you choose to use. Well, maybe the, the, the choice of the user interface has an impact. But seriously, the faster you can iterate on your APIs, the faster you can add features on your APIs, the faster you can get your APIs into production and test it and deploy it, the better your mobile apps. The, the dumber the mobile app itself and the more smarter the API will give you lots of flexibility to the future. Remember the classic pin the principles of being chunky but not chatty, for those who remember the, the recommendations from Microsoft back in the 2000s when .NET was coming. They still apply these days. Mobile products and companies are created and, and, and created by APIs, not app stores. Pay attention to your API. The API is a fundamental component. And I would suggest looking forward to the next step. REST is OK, but it's still polling. You're polling the server every time you want something else. Move on to real-time protocols. Move on to messaging, to socket I.O., to technologies that actually allow you to have live updates in your mobile apps. I think there's a frontier there. We're getting there right now. And it's really interesting to see what's going on. And I think all of us can use these technologies these days in our own apps. So keep an eye on that for your next application. The final thing that has kept me alive is actually to always pay attention to the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. Always fight complexity. Complexity is bad. Whenever you have to create an app, think of the simplest possible mental model and design model and code model for your app that works, that provides the value that you want. Don't over-architect. For the love of God, don't. Don't over-architect. Because then you have situations like, you know, I want to create the Rails app, and ugh, I need <laughs> Rails, RBM, Brew, Excel tools, and so on. Anyway, we reached the conclusion, we reached the end of the great, this great day. Uh, the conclusion that I reached was that age doesn't matter. Being a developer at age 40 is exactly the same as being a developer at age 17 or 59. It doesn't make any difference. Because as long as you are waking up every morning and you're actually happy about what you're doing, you're going to make a great app. You're going to be a great developer, no matter what your age. I've met a software developer. We've met with Nicola. We know very well Nicola back in the times of the developer, uh, of the Swiss developers in the French side of Switzerland. We had a group a couple of years ago. And one day, there's this person who came to us. He was a 79-year-old developer. He came and he showed us. He said, well, I have this little app I would like to show you. This is, was in 2009. He had created a 3D OpenGL-powered uh, puzzle. And I remember the silence, maybe you, Nicola, you remember the silence in the room of seeing one of the most polished, fast, snappiest games we have ever seen. And I had the tremendous privilege of actually helping him with the source code. He needed some coaching. It's one of the best, most beautiful pieces of Objective-C code I've seen in my life. Uh, the, the guy had an experience of 50 years of a, as a developer, 30 of which exclusively on C++. He was a tremendous developer, and he had this brightness in the eyes. He was incredible, incredible, absolutely incredible souvenir. So seriously, I think now, what about in 
19 years from now. In 19 years from now, it will be 2035. In 2035, we're going to remember, of course, somebody will give a speech like mine, saying, well, it was the year that uh, David Bowie was gone, Harper Lee, and the guy from Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Prince. I should have probably have put Prince instead, but I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I forgot to update the slide. And, of course, he will give an introduction of what the technology escape was like, but he will tell the telling story of a guy who lost to a computer, and this time it was not brute force. We actually got to the point which is actual artificial intelligence at play, and it really changes the game. And it's also the year where Microsoft published SQL Server for Linux, and it turns out that it's probably the year where Google started considering to use Swift for Android, which actually means a lot. Unfortunately, it's also the year where something very dear we didn't know we had it's probably going to go away. So I just leave this because by 2035, everybody will be freaking out about the 2038 year problem. Okay, this, it's coming back. Everything comes back in computers, I tell you. Uh, and in any case, I wanted to leave you with one more Fortune Pony say quote, nothing is as simple as it seems at first or as hopeless as it seems in the middle or as finished as it seems in the end. So anything I say about the future, please take it with a grain of salt, okay? Because I'm not that good at telling the future, but you've been a great audience and thank you so much. Bring back nightmares, that really does. <laughs> okay, it's been, it's been a really great day. Uh, thanks all for, for sticking through it. Um, can we just say thank you to all the speakers who've been on today uh, by just um, giving them another round of applause for their work? Thank you.